people who swear without realising they're swearing. I come from scaffolders and plasterers and shoemakers and carers. The type of carers pay pence per minute to visit an old lady's house. Some of my people have been inside a prison. Sometimes I tilt towards them and see myself reflected back. If they were from Yorkshire, which they're not, but if they were, they would have been the ones on the pickets shouting scab and throwing bricks at policemen. I come from a line of women who get married twice. I come from a line of women who bring up children and men who go to work. If I knew who my people were in the time before women were allowed to work, they were probably the women who were working anyway. If I knew who my people were before women got the vote, they would not have cared about the vote. There are many arguments among my people. Nobody likes everybody. In the time of slavery, my people would have had them if they were the type of people who could afford them, which they probably weren't. In the time of casual racism, some of my people would and will join in. Some of my people know everybody who lives on their street. They're the type of people who will argue with the teacher if their child has detention. The women of my people are wolves and we talk to the moon in our sleep. Um, <clears throat> so I don't normally read that poem any further south than Manchester. <laughs> because all my family lived down in Leicester. So I figure, I figure I'm safe here. And after saying my family um, are the type of people who argue with the teacher if their child has detention, I then became a teacher and saw it from the other, from the other side. Um, so I worked for 13 years as a trumpet teacher, travelling around um, to about 25 schools a week, um, teaching classes of 30, 8 and 9 year olds how to play the trumpet. Um, <clears throat> which in some, some days was as bad as that sounds. <laughs> I liked that none of you laughed at that. I don't know if you were just feeling pity for me. But now, I actually really grew to love that type of teaching. It was like having my own army. <clears throat> but um, the first year I started working as a poet, I wrote this poem. Um, I spent the whole of the summer holidays swanning around at poetry readings and then had to go back to work in September and get covered in like spittle from trumpets and like bad boy oil. And <clears throat> and the only other thing you need to know is the teachers had to learn the trumpet as well, alongside the kids. The trumpet teacher's purse. A curse on the children who tap the mouthpiece with the heel of their hand to make a popping sound. Who drop the trumpet on the floor, then laugh. A darker curse on those who fall with the trumpet in their hands and selfishly save themselves. A curse on the boy who dropped a pencil on the bell of his trombone to see if it did what I said it would. A curse on the girl who stuffed a pom-pom down her cornet and then said it was her invisible friend who did it. A curse on the class teacher who sits at the back of the room and does her paperwork. A curse on the teacher who says, I'm rubbish at music, in a loud enough voice for the whole class to hear. A curse on the father who coated his daughter's trumpet valves with Vaseline because he thought it was a thing to do. A curse on the boy who threw up in his baritone as if it was his own personal bucket. Let them be played with the urge to practice every day without improvement. Let them play in concerts each weekend which involve marching and outdoors and coldness. Let their family be forced to give up their Saturdays listening to bad music in village halls. Or spend their Sundays at the bandstand. Then, one dog and the drunk who slept there the night before, taking up the one and only bench. Gods, let it rain. <coughs> Um, I always read my poems to my mum and dad who aren't over the phone, who aren't poets at all and don't read poetry. Um, but I like to torture them in that way. And when I read that poem to my mum, she went, well that was just my life! <laughs> Which I thought was a bit harsh. 
Um, <clears throat> so a couple of months ago now, I did a, a program on radio, a poetry program on Radio 4, where I um, went to, it came about as a chance conversation with someone. Um, and I, I ended up doing this program where I went to my dad's scaffold, my dad's a scaffolder, and I went to his site and spent some time on the scaffolding site. And uh, the producers thought it would be a great idea to clip my dad up with a radio mic and send him up the scaffold. We didn't use any of that, um, <laughs> any of that audio at all. Um, but basically, it was, it was great fun doing the radio program, but my dad completely stole the show. Like, people kept coming up to me going, I really liked the poetry program. Wasn't your dad amazing? And I was like, he was all right. <laughs> I was there too. Um, and one of the things my dad said in this, when we were interviewing him, was that he doesn't know any scaffolders that like poetry. And then after the programme went out on the radio, I had about four or five scaffolders email me and say, I'm a scaffolder and I like poetry. And then um, one of them said he was coming today, so I don't know if he's, if he's here. Um, if, if you are here, Colin, I hope you've brought your belt and your harness so I can get a photo and send it to my dad to prove that you exist. Um, I'm on the wrong page. So I'm going to read this poem for, for Colin. A song for the scaffolders, who balance like tightrope walkers, who could run up the bracing faster than you or I could climb a ladder, who wore red shorts and worked bare chested, who cooked their safety vests in half. A song for the scaffolders and their vans, their steel toe capped boots, their coffee mugs. A song for those who learned to put up a scaffold standing on just one board. A song for the scaffolder who could put a six inch nail in a piece of wood with just his palm. A song for those who don't like rules or things taking too long. Who now mustn't go to work uncovered. Who mustn't cut their safety vests or climb without ladders. Who must use three boards at all times. A song for the scaffolders who fall with a harness on. Who have ten minutes to be rescued. A song for the scaffolder who fell in a clear area, a tube giving way, that long, slow fall. A song for him who fell 30 feet and survived. A song for the scaffolder who saw him fall. A song for those at the top of buildings, the wind whistling in their ears, the sky in their voices. For those who lift and carry and shout and swear. For those who can recite the lengths of boards and tubes like a song. A song for them, the ones who don't like heights but spent their whole life hiding it. A song for those who work too long. A song for my father, a song for him. So there's a, a sequence in the middle of the book called How I Abandoned My Body to His Keeping, um, which explores the domestic violence. So I'm just going to read two poems, one after the other, without any of my amazing witty repartee. In that year. And in that year, my body was a pillar of smoke and even his hands could not hold me. And in that year my mind was an empty table, and he laid his thoughts down like dishes of plenty. And in that year my heart was the old monument of folly, and no use could be found for it. And in that year my tongue spoke the language of insects, and not even my father knew me. And in that year I waited for the horses, but they only shifted their feet in the darkness. And in that year I imagined a vain thing, I believed that the world would come for me. And in that year I gave up on all the things I was promised, and left myself to sadness. And then that year lay down like a path, and I walked it, I walked it, I walked it. Body, remember that night 
pretended it was a film. You had a soundtrack running through your head. Don't lie to anybody. You know what it is. You're keeping it from me. The stretched white sheets of a bed. The spinning round of it. The high, whining sound in the head. Body, you remember how it felt. Surely, surely. You're lying to me. Show me how to recognise the glint in the eye of the dog, the rabid dog. Remind me, O oh body, of the way he moved when he drank, that dangerous silence. Let me feel how I let my eyes drop, birds falling from a sky. How my heart was a field and there was a dog loose in the field. It was worrying the sheep, they were running, and then they were still. O oh body, let me remember what it was to have a field in my chest. O oh body, let me recognise the dog. <coughs> so I'm just going to finish off with a couple of new poems. Um, so as Rachel said, I'm doing a, a PhD and um, writing poems about everyday sexism and female desire and how they kind of mix up together sometimes. And I dropped my poems on the way in and then forgot to uh, there, right on. <clears throat> so the, whole, the, the book's going to be called All the Men I Never Married and each poem is just a number so I don't have to think of titles. Um, so just all the men I never married, number one, number two. Um, it started off as a bit of fun and a joke after finishing the last book, and then I got to number 30 and I thought, right, this is getting a bit out of hand now. Um, <coughs> so I thought I'd read the poem that started, started it all off. And this is now, um, well, it's either going to be number one in the book or number 41. There was the boy who I met on the park, who tasted of humbugs and wore a mustard yellow jumper. And the kickboxer with beautiful long brown hair that he tied with a band at the nape of his neck. And the one who had a constant ear infection, so I sat always on his left. And the guy who worked in an office and could only afford to fill up his car with two pounds worth of petrol. And the trumpet player I loved from the moment I saw him dancing to the Rolling Stones. And the guy who smoked weed and got more and more paranoid, whose fingers flickered and danced when he talked. And the one whose eyes were two pieces of winter sky. And a music producer, long-legged and full of opinions. And more trumpet players, one who is too short and not him, and one who is too thin and not him. Are you judging me yet? Are you surprised? Let me tell you of the ones I never kissed, or who never kissed me. The trombonist I went drinking with. How we lay twice a week in each other's beds like two unlit candles. We were not for each other, and in this we were wise. We were only moving through the world together for a time. There was a double bassist who stood behind me, and angled the body of his bass into mine, and shadowed my hands on its neck. And all I could feel was heat from his skin and the lightest breath. And even this might have been imagined. I want to say to them now, though all we are to each other is ghosts, once you were all that I thought of. When I whisper your names, it isn't a curse or a spell or a blessing. I'm not mourning your passing or calling you here. This is something harder like walking alone in the dusk and the leaves. This is the naming of trees. This is a series of flames. This is watching you all disappear. Um, <clears throat> you're much better behaved than the Grave of Sam's Luncheon Club. <laughs> when I got to that line that says, are you surprised, are you judging me yet? This elderly lady went, yes! <laughs> Um, 
Uh, I started this. I wrote this poem because I thought it was. I thought it was funny when I thought back about the experience. I meant it to be funny, so I think the kind of meter that I use in the poem was kind of sounds a little bit comical. But then I don't know if anyone else had the, this experience when it when I wrote it down and it appeared on paper. I thought that's not actually very funny at all. It's quite disturbing. Um, so this is all the men I never married. Number three. And I'm going to do one short one to finish off after this. It didn't really help the story of Othello and Desdemona, and Iago and poison in the ear. And though our teacher taught us about poor Desdemona and bad Iago, Othello escaped almost blame free, possessed by jealousy, driven into a state. So when my ex became my stalker, all the boys in class ignored me. In every lesson he looked through me until the evenings when he was drunk and in a nightclub and then he'd ring and start to cry and try to find out where I was or where I'd been, asking why I wouldn't listen, why I'd stopped picking up the phone. Sometimes I answered it with silence, imagined him alone, listening to my nothing. That year of A-levels, I got myself a stalker and the police said, aren't you flattered? In the station there was laughter at the 40 phone calls every day for weeks. He said that I'd agreed to be with him forever, and then I changed my mind. What could he do but become my stalker and wait till darkness fell and slash my father's tires or call fire engines to my house, though there was nothing catching fire? When my ex became my stalker, he convinced my mum to let him in, then locked himself inside the bathroom. It felt like I'd let him win, even though it finished with him in a police cell because of texts he'd sent with threats and words like kill and guess what happens next. And so the police kept him overnight to think about his actions and rang his mother, who had no idea how any of this happened. <coughs> um, I wrote that because the, the, the person in question sent me a Facebook friend request. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> After I'd uh, looked at his profile, see what he was doing, of course. Um, so, thank you for, for having me, and thank you again, Rachel, for the, the nice introduction. Um, it's been great to be here again. We were trying to work out when I was last here, I think it was six or seven years ago, maybe. Um, this is all the men I never married, number two. I knew it was dangerous. Knew he was not mine. Knew he belonged to another who had left behind easy as slipping off a coat. Knew that was a bad sign, but didn't know enough to turn aside, to turn my back, to not pick up the phone when his name appeared. Oh, I knew nothing back then. I thought sex was a promise that would keep being fulfilled. I thought love was a knife pressed to the throat, not just his, not just mine. I thought there was a blade in each of our hands. I am telling this now so he appears, as real as that first night when we didn't sleep, the slight red stubble of his beard, the freckles covering his arms, his gaze, his attention all mine. Oh, back then I never wanted it to end, the touching, the looking. I knew nothing of how a person is already fractured or broken by the time we meet them. It was just like Wilker said, his gaze was a lamp turned low. Although at that point I'd not read Wilker, knew nothing about what it means to be seen, what it means to change or be changed, to appear, to burst like a star. Thank you.